Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 18. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 18. We're going to look at verses 1 through 17. It's a famous passage. The title of the message is The Potter and the Clay. The Potter and the Clay. The Potter and the Clay. Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 17. The Potter and the Clay. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 1. The Bible says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Said the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that he obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good, wherewith I said I will benefit them. Verse 11. Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. Therefore thus said the Lord, Ask ye now among the heathen, Who has heard such things? The virgin of Israel had done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave, leave the snow of Lebanon, which cometh from the rock of the field, or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity, and they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient path, to walk in path in a way not cast up, to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing. Everyone that passes thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the, I'll show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Brother Oscar, can you please pray for the message? Lord God, we come to you and we just want to hear the word of God preached. No. Thank you, Lord, for having us all gathered here together. Yes. And just hear your word and change our hearts so that we can do your will. Amen. Lord God, please fill the pastor with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Amen. And please fill us with the Holy Spirit so we can learn and just be guided only in you. Please bless the rest of the day. Would you see my pray? Amen. 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 Excuse me. The potter and the clay is a very famous passage. I'm pretty sure you've heard it many, many times. There are many songs written about it. Even before, when I became a Bible believer, when I was going to contemporary church, there was always song about, you know, you are the potter, I am the clay. And as you can see, you know, the potter is the Lord, and you are the clay. Yes. So I'm the clay, you're the clay. Then who is the owner? God is the owner in the first place. Then who should be molding you and shaping you? Is it you? No. Is it your mother, father, grandfather? No, it's the Lord himself. Amen. When Lord molds you and me, he has a plan and purpose. And in his will, 
He wants to make you come out the best shape possible. I don't know if you've been on a wheel, you know, potter's wheel, trying to create something. You know, if you took a pottery class, you know, interesting. If you go, you know, I took it one time, mine didn't come out that good, but it was still usable. You know, made a, I think like a plate. You know, plate doesn't have to be that pretty. You know, there are a lot of arts out there to you and I. It looks very pedestrian. But to the eye of the beholder, it looks pretty good. You know, mine look okay. I don't know about you guys, you know, you try to mold your thing the best way you want to do it, and you want it to come out the best looking as possible. But many times, it doesn't work out like that, you know, because you don't have the skills to do it, you don't have the experience to do it. And in your life, if you become the potter instead of the Lord, it's going to always come out the wrong way. It's always going to break. It's always going to look as if, you know, some amateur, some novice has done it. But our life then shows that since Lord's not the potter, you're trying to be the potter in your life, it looks really amateurish, novice, you know, just like a, how should I say, like a baby's work. And if your life is exemplified by something that baby would create, then it just shows who you have, who you let someone control the potter's will. In the Bible, you see many cases where Lord is shaping up people, especially in the prophets. Yeah. I don't know about you. I mean, they had one of the hardest ministries ever. And they told you, I mean, God told them to do certain things. And I don't know if you will be able to do those certain things. Let's look at it. Let's look at example, Isaiah. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 20. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. Isaiah 20, verse 3. Look at some of the ministries. Look at some of the molding. Look how the potter molded Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah hath walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and upon Ethiopia. Wow. How many of you guys want to walk naked, barefoot? Three years for a sign and wonder upon Egypt and Ethiopia. I mean, that is one of the hardest ministry if there was one, right? Yeah, I mean, but Isaiah obeyed, you know? Isaiah just obeyed. At this point, you and I should just realize that best thing to do is just obey. Yeah. I mean, just obey. I mean, if you want potter to work in your life, you just have to obey. And there's going to be certain situations that come in your life. It's hard to understand, right? Yes. I mean, Lord goes, walk Ontario naked for three, and a, three years for a sign to this community or to the United States. I mean, that is really, really hard to understand. But if you have heart like Isaiah, you'll just obey. Very, very easier said than done. Let's go to another example. Let's go to Hosea, book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1. Hosea chapter 1. Right after Daniel. Hosea chapter 1. Verses 2 and 3. I know some of you, and if Lord tarries, would like to get married, right? You know, start a family. Let's look at what happened to Hosea. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredom, 
and children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Dibline, which conceived and bare him a son. You know, people already don't like in many cultures because, you know, they already set you up with a person to be married at the given age. But in this case, Lord said to show as a symbol to the nation of Israel, because they're committing great whoredom, go marry, you know, harlot, whore, right? If Lord were to tell you that, what would you do? I mean, some of you guys have great imagination. I don't know about guys too much, but the, you know, women and girls, they have their own imagination and fantasy of their marriage, right? It's like uh, something that you look forward to. But the Lord tells you, no, no, that's not, that's not how I want you to get married, okay? Let's find the harlot, and you marry that person. I mean, many of you guys will be like, whoa, I don't know, Lord, you know, I, I marry once, so I want to you know, marry someone, like a Bible believer, per se, with the same faith, you know, on a more on the holier side. But Lord goes, no, my will for you in your life is to be a symbol to the nation of Israel, to show them that they're committing great whoredom, departing from me. So you have to marry someone, you know, who's a harlot, who's a whore. That is a very, very hard thing to follow. I mean, unmarried people here, you think you could just do that? Well, Lord goes, hey, you know, go to that brothel and then get someone to marry. Right? Whether it's male brothel or <laughs> female brothel, right? Oh, Amen. But you could see that's how Potter works. Only way you could become or you could be someone who can be used by God, like Isaiah and Hosea, you have to understand you're a clay. When you're a clay, you let the Potter do whatever he wants to do. Amen. You cannot have your own will as a clay. When I was molding that plate, that clay had no will against me. That clay couldn't just stop from me, you know, pressing it hard, you know, taking it off and putting it back on to make it look as good to me, not to the clay. I mean, many times we forget. Clay, inanimate thing, doesn't talk back to you. You just do whatever you wanted to do it. If you're the clay and the Lord is the potter, man, it's hard to understand why you always talk back to the Lord. Yeah. I mean, isn't that funny? If you were to really illustrate it, maybe, you know, I think we had an evangelist, David Engelset. Or, I forget, yeah, I think that's his last name. He actually carries the equipment around. He's actually a master potter, yeah. you know. And then when he preaches, he actually shows it yeah. uh, during the preaching. I mean, I'm not at his level, but I could actually kind of imitate because the product wouldn't be as good, but it's usable. If I were to make a cup out of it, as long as it doesn't leak, you could use it, right? And I'll sign it on the bottom, you know. It'll be worth like two cents. But hey, the thing is, if you realize that you are a clay, you would understand that I don't have will of my own at the end of the day. So in order to be used by God as a clay, first thing you have to realize is that 
you can't be stiff-necked. That's number one. You and I cannot be stiff-necked people. What was a common characteristic in the Word of God for Israelites? Stiff-necked. You know, and one of the best ways to describe a stiff-necked person is that they're very stubborn. Yes. Why do people don't get saved? Because they're stubborn. And stubbornness equals haughtiness, pride, right? Yeah. Unmovable in the wrong way. You know, you should be unmovable standing in the truth, right. like King James Bible. Yes. But when it comes to molding your life to God's will, you can't be stiff-necked. Turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 33. We'll look at some you know, examples. Exodus chapter 33. When you're stiff-necked, your status, your state becomes hard. When clay is hard, you can't use it. When something like that becomes hard, what do you have to do in order to use it again? You gotta break it. And if you had the feeling of the clay and everything's being broken, man, it hurts. Yes. Imagine you're the clay and all, some parts of your bone has to break. Mm. I mean, that's, that's, that's a scary feeling. Yeah. But as Christians, you have to understand, many times God has to break you. Amen. Whether it's emotionally, Physically, God has to break you so that he could use you again. Exodus chapter 33. Look at verse 3. Unto a land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Look at verse 5. For the Lord has said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up unto the midst of thee in a moment and consume thee. Therefore, now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. Go to chapter 34, chapter 34, verse 9. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Stiff-necked people. Unless you change your way, unless you turn away from your stubborn ways, God cannot use you. Simple as that. If you look at your heart right now, is it hard? Has it become stiff-necked? If your heart is hard, your, you yourself becomes hard. And you know what Bible talks about hard people? Many times, they're just transgressors, sinners. You're stiff-necked. Your heart is hard. Your heart is hard. Your life is hard. Equals transgressor, sinner. Turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13, look at verse 5. So you must realize and you must recognize, am I a stiff-necked person right now? When the Lord tries to mold me and make me so that I could be useful like Isaiah and Hosea, if, have I become so hard at this point to be molded and to be moved? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 5, the Bible says, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, verse 15. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, the Bible says, Good understanding giveth favor, but the way of transgressors is hard. Transgressors is hard. And how did they become transgressor? And why are they hard? Because their heart is hardened. Turn to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. So you have to realize, 
And you have to really, really examine yourself. Have I become hard, right? I mean, is my heart really hardened to the place where Lord has to only break me in order to use me again? Hopefully, you're not to that severe state yet. Maybe there's still a chance for Lord to mold you, yes. you know, without completely breaking you apart. Mm. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, the Bible says, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Because you're stiff-necked, because you're stubborn, and because of the deceitfulness of sin, your heart is hardened. And when your heart is hardened, it translates into sin. Transgressors. Life of transgressor, life of sinners. I mean, we're sinners, but life of sinners who con continuously commit sin yeah. is very hard. Amen. That's, right. That's why, you know, you could ask yourself, why is your life so hard? I'm not talking about, generally speaking, as a Bible-believing Christian living in this wicked world, nothing's going to be easy. But because you're living in the will of God with your obedience to the Lord, because you're being filled with the Holy Ghost, spiritually speaking, it's not hard. Amen. Because you have the joy of the Lord inside of you. Yes. Just like Bible continually says, rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice. Because your hope is in the Lord, your joy is in the Lord, your comfort is in the Lord, everything is in the Lord. Amen. That's why your life, at the end of the day, shouldn't be hard. But why is it that so many of you, your life is hard? Just like that clay is so hard, yes. it's so hardened because it, you don't let the Lord mold it. Right. Yeah. Then the result is what? It's become so hard that there's only one solution for the Lord to use you again. He has to break it. He has to break you apart. Man, you know, that's why the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I mean, if you want to be wise, fear the Lord. Fear the Lord who can break you apart. Especially as a loving father who chastises his own children. And one of the ways he's doing what? As a potter. He has to break it apart. Yes. If you, again, if you ever done any kind of pottery work, you know, took a class or whatnot, you have to break some of the hard rocks, hard clay, to make it usable again. Unless you realize that you have stubborn heart, stubborn attitude, stubbornly acting continuously, Lord cannot use you. Lord cannot mold you. Then essentially, what's that telling you? You have to humble yourself right now. Yes. You have to put yourself down. You have to realize that you're nothing. Amen. So that you could let the Lord use you. When you think you're any kind of something, then Lord cannot use you. Because if you're not humble, if you're not in a lowly state, you're going to constantly become a transgressor. You're going to stay as a sinner. Then, man, I, so this is clay. In order for me to make the plate that I want or the cup that I want, I have to use every part. But if this part doesn't use it, I, mean, I can't use it, then I can't get the product that I want. If you want Lord to use you, you have to make sure that, you know what? I have to first put myself down. I have to be in a humble state. I have to be in a lowly state. So that when Lord does mold me and wants to mold me in a way that he wants, I'm going to let him do it. And that's when obedience becomes easy. Go to this land naked. Go marry this person. Do this, do that. And it becomes easier and easier. That's why 
especially those of you who are more stubborn than others, you better break that. Yes. You better get right with the Lord. Yes, sir. Certain people are more stubborn than others, I tell you that. Amen. You know, certain ethnicity is more stubborn than the others, right? Yes. Certain generation is more stubborn than the others, yes. right? You know, Dr. Workman used to say, the worst or the saddest people are the old woman who's not saved. They really have to be stubborn because they're generally, they have that mother's instinct. They have a softer heart. But in order for you to get to that point when you're 70, 80, and 90 and you still reject the gospel, man, you must be stubborn. Like your middle name is stubborn. A lot of men are stubborn because men have many, many pride issues anyways. Amen. Then you have to go to the Lord I mean, hopefully today, right? Don't wait until tomorrow. And I'm going to stay stiff-necked for another day, Lord. Oh. <laughs> Can you imagine if the Lord says, okay, time to break that stiff neck. Okay. I mean, if he does it literally, what's going to happen to you? I yeah. mean, you're paralyzed. You can't do anything. Right. Some people are spiritually paralyzed, though. Yeah. And they can't get up anymore. And Lord has given them many, 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 many chances. You know, the scary thing about the Lord is that I say it over and over through my own experience and seeing others' experience and, you know, counseling and talking to people constantly. When your time is up, your time is up. And when the Lord says your cup is full, it's over. I mean, literally, you can't go back. But thank God that... He's giving you second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, continue, hundreds and thousands of chances. The fact that you're sitting here today and listening, Lord is giving you another chance. Because you and I are not perfect. Let me tell you that right off the bat. You think you're perfect sometimes. You're not. You'll never be perfect. You know, until the day of the rapture or, you know. Until you go to heaven. You just can't. Then when you see that, okay, I'm a clay. You know, I've been a stubborn clay, stiff-necked clay. And Lord has given me another opportunity. Then I'm not going to let this opportunity, this chance go to waste anymore. People who make something out of their life are usually people who get second chances, third chances, and they make the best out of that situation. Because they learn from their mistakes. They learn from their failures. You want Lord to use you after getting rid of your stubbornness, stiff neck status? And secondly, you have to learn now from your failures and mistakes. You can't be a repeat offender over and over. How many of you guys think that you're not a repeat offender? I mean, you are. But how big of a repeat offender are you? That's the question. Because you and I are not perfect. But, man, at this point in your Christian walk with the Lord, especially if you've been saved for many, many years, You can't be doing more sin than when you got saved. I mean, that's like growing backwards. But many people grow backwards and, you know, they just end up like that. They end up with diapers their whole Christian life, just sucking their thumbs and crying all the time. Man, that is a horrible picture. If you've been saved for at least like, say you've been saved for five years, but you're still acting like a little baby who was just born, that's not a pretty sight. If you've been saved for 10 years and you're still wearing diapers and looking for milk, man, that is not a good picture. Man, but if you've been saved for 20 years, 
because some of you guys have been saved for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. You kind of grew up to your you know, adolescence, but you're going backwards in age. And 20 years later, you're just the same as a little baby. There's no closeness with the Lord. You don't love the Bible like you used to. You don't have any love for the lost souls out there. You don't have love for the brethren. I mean, you're just more selfish than ever. You're more stiff-necked than ever. You're more stubborn than ever. Like the preachings, teachings doesn't move you at all. Man, you are a stubborn person. You are a stiff-necked person. Man, that nation couldn't even go to the promised land because they were stiff-necked people. How much blessing have they lost? When you think about it, if you ask them if they could do it all over again, they'll do it all over again. I mean, literally. With you, you don't want to get to that point where you have no chance to do it all over again. That's why you have to learn from your failures and mistakes. Amen. You have to, especially as a Bible believer. That should be your main strong characteristic. I know I'm going to fall, but I'm going to get up. But you have to get up the right way. Because many people get up the wrong way. And they fall again. I mean, think about it. You fail because you always had a misstep coming down this pulpit. Right? So I'm walking down, and then, you know, I misstep and I fall. Okay, second time if I go there, I shouldn't do that again. Because it hurt. And because it looks stupid, and because, you know, it's not going to keep me healthy. But if I were to do it over and over and over, even though I got back up, you know, gotten back up, what does that tell you? You haven't learned anything. And at that point, one of the times, if I fall the wrong way, you know, I could hit my head and I could just die. So many of you guys are falling, but many of you guys are not getting up the right way. That's the problem. I mean, you're doing like that half-hearted effort, not all 100% full effort. Lord, I've fallen. I fall into that sin. I fall into that situation. So I'm going to get up again. So, I mean, you do come to church. You do street preaching, and you do Wednesday service. But that's just covering up. It's like a little band-aid, covered up band-aid. But when that situation arises again, you fall exactly the same way or even harder. Then what happens? There's never a growth. And one day when that fall is unbearable and you can't handle it anymore, then it's over. And just because, you know, God is God of grace and mercy, don't forget, God is just God as well. And fair God as well. Man, that's why the judgment is going to be scary. Everybody's going to try to justify themselves. Hey, you are the potter, but you didn't mold me the right way. Can you imagine? But it's going to be a common thing. Lord, you know, you didn't put enough water in my life to be useful to you. You just let me dry up and become, you know, hard as a rock. That's why you couldn't use me. But the Lord's going to play your life. Yeah. After you got saved every second of your life. Yeah. Hey, look at that point. I gave you water. I tried to soften you up, but you never changed. Well, look at that. I gave you another chance. Man, at that point, you know, your legs are buckling already. I mean, your head is already on the ground. You know, tears are dripping from your eyes. I mean, you're, keep, you're constantly, the only thing you could say is, you know, You know, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, you know. And Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because you took granted for all the second, third, multiple opportunities that Lord has given you. You got to understand, one of these days, if you stay stiff-necked and you neglect the failures 
And then you stay as a someone who goes, you know, I know what I'm doing. Have you heard that many times? Yes. I know what I'm doing. Too many times. Husbands and wives, Amen. you ask each other, I know what I'm doing, right? Yeah. And exactly, you know they don't know what they're doing, right? Or, are you sure you know what you're doing when you're making that? Yeah, I know what I'm doing. And then, you know, you have to break it again, right? <laughs> Do you know what you're doing? No, that screw doesn't go in that way. It's the other side. No, I know what I'm doing. And then after you build it, you have to disassemble it again because screw should have been on the other side. Right? Do you know what you're doing? That's too much salt in it. I know what I'm doing. It's too salty, you can't eat anymore. Right? Like, do you know? Do you know? And then all your answer is like, I know what I'm doing. Man, what a bad attitude. Amen. What a bad clay. Yeah. You're telling the Lord. You know, he's the master potter, and he knows better than anybody in the whole wide world universe, and he knows what's best for you, your purpose and will in your life, and you go, I know what I'm doing, Lord. I know you've given me many, many chances, but I don't think that's how it works. Man, that's like a little kid, you know. That's like Sean's, you know, it's his birthday telling his mom and dad, I know what I'm doing. I know how to dress. I know how to eat. I know what to study. Man, I know how to get to places. You just listen to me, right? Take me to Disneyland, take me to Nosbury Farm, take me to, you know, Six Flags, take me to Adventureland, take me to, what is it, Chuck E. Cheese's, you know? Take me to all this pizza place, hamburger place. I know what I'm doing. Oh, vegetables? No, no, no. I only want meat, savory meat. I know what I'm doing. Oh, math? I hate math. Okay, no more math in my curriculum, right? History? Nah. I only want to study PE, you know, <laughs> outside with my friends or with you. <laughs> okay, and if you are parents of Sean, you know, brother, you know, Calvin and Sister Amber, you listen to your kid for everything like that, what is going to happen? The kids cannot be destroyed sooner than later. If Lord's giving you and I this much chance, then we can't end up, and we shouldn't end up like Israelites. We shouldn't be characterized as a stiff-necked Bible believers. You know, a lot of times, that's one of the faults of being a Bible believer. You and I know the truth. And you think you're better than everybody now. And then you're like so stiff neck. I mean, thank God that we know King James Bible and the right doctrine and the dispensationalism. But if someone tells you, trying to have a conversation with you, and you're like, no, you devil. I mean, they're safe Christians, right? You're, you devil, I, you get out of here, you know. They're like, you're just stiff neck. I mean. I mean, they need the truth, too. Yeah. I mean, you were at one point in your life just like them or worse. Right. Yeah. What makes you such a stubborn person and such a proud person that you are the only one who deserves to have truth? Don't be like that, Bible believers. You have to have soft heart. Amen. You have to have compassion. You have to let the Lord move you, mold you, so that when someone else needs assistance, help, someone else needs the truth, you won't act like a stiff-necked person don't want to look that way. You know, sometimes when you think about stiff neck, right, it hurts, right? Yes. I mean, you can't move. Like, if you, if it's like you slept the wrong way, right. you know, and then it's like solid, you know, like it feels like a rock and you can't move, and if you try to move, like every muscle in the pain is, you know, shooting sharp pains at you, it's tough. But that's how people look at you many times. Because all they could see is this proud, this know-it-all, you know, so-called Bible believer. There's huge difference, though. Knowing the truth and being 
strong and standing for the truth and knowing the truth and being a, you know, big-headed. People are not stupid. People can feel. People can understand. They might hate you for what you believe in and what you stand for, but they'll respect you. But those who are stiff-necked and stubborn, they hate you and they don't respect you. Right? Because you have no sense of humility at all. Again, if you want the Lord to use you and realize that you're in his hand, when you know you're in God's hand, your attitude literally changes. Can you imagine? Like, okay, I know I'm in Lord's hand 24-7. Literally 24-7. Even at this moment, my thoughts are in Lord's hand. Everything, my heart is in Lord's hand. You're going to think twice before you have different thought again. Can you believe it? If every one of you have a, that little TV station or thinking cap on your head, and it's playing right now for everyone to view. Right? I wonder what's playing. Right? If you're in God's hand, I know you're, all your might will be in the Word of God and listening to the Word of God, listening to preaching, trying to you know, make sure that your life changes for the better, serving the Lord. However, if you are stiff-necked, stubborn, you, know, you don't care, and you don't know that you're in Lord's hand, guarantee a lot, of, a lot of different things is playing in your head, right? It includes lust, drinking, money, conceit, you know, everything else. Everything about being popular, crooked, broad, that's what's playing on your head. Are you going to let that continue in your life? I mean, shouldn't you say it's enough? Yes. Shouldn't you say no more? Man, I'm tired of being, you know, my heart being so hardened. I'm tired of being such a hard person. Amen. I want to be soft. Amen. I want to be given to the Lord. Yes. I want the Lord to mold me and make me as someone that he wants me to be. But in conclusion, it's all up to you. One thing about our God, he's not like Calvinist God, right? He's not going to force you. Yeah. You and I have that free will. That's right. We could either break our stiff neck ways and stubborn ways and yield to the Lord yeah. in every part of our life and understand that we're in Lord's hand with the fear of the Lord in our heart. Or, with your own free will, you could reject another chance that Lord has given you, stay stiff-necked, stay stubborn, and be broken. Be broken into pieces. And sad to say, you might end up as a paralyzed, spiritually paralyzed Christian until you leave this earth. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be used by the potter? Let's pray.